because we will have now a sort of a roundtable discussion about uh, some key considerations about the use of ECP in GVHD. Uh, apologies, I didn't show my disclosures in the introduction, so here they are. Uh, okay, so we, uh, I think, all know, I, I want to just introduce the discussion, but I think everybody's familiar with all this. We all know that uh, beside disease relapse, which is the major cause of failures these days of a transplant procedure, actually, what we're struggling with is the uh, severe GI acute GVHD in general. And on the other hand, chronic GVHD actually. And chronic GVHD, even the mild forms are going to have an impact on the quality of life uh, of the patient. And of course, we are all fortunate that recently we had some good agents being approved, but I don't believe uh, they have uh, solved, I would say, the problem of the steroid refractory QGVHD. Ruxolitinib has been approved thanks to the REACH2 trial in uh, steroid refractory chronic GVHD. We have, at least in the US, the approval of uh, ubritinib, ruxolitinib, belumozidil. But again, I think uh, uh, there are still a few uh, problems in this field, especially that the incidence, according so, to one of our analysis uh, performed a few years ago, the incidence of chronic GVHD actually is not decreasing. Story may be different today with the use of post psi, but the incidence is not decreasing because we're treating more and more elderly patients, high risk disease, we're doing more DLI. We're actually stopping immunosuppressive therapy early because of the high risk uh, uh, disease. When it comes to acute GVHD, I would say it's still disappointing because our first line treatment about steroids, we didn't make much progress in the first line treatment since uh, uh, four uh, decades. And you heard very nicely uh, about uh, uh, how easy ECP uh, can be done, assuming you have the right machine, of course. Uh, and I would, I mean, while listening to you, Professor Greinix, I thought that ECP is a sort of a Swiss knife of uh, GVC treatment. You can do it alone, you can do it in acute, you can do it in chronic, you can combine it with many things, which is, quite amazing because it is actually safe and there are some uh, immunological uh, basis uh, for the success of this technology, which I think, I don't know, I, I don't recall you mentioned this, but this has been started in the 80s uh, in cutaneous uh, T-cell uh, lymphoma. And it is actually, uh, the technology is accepted, approved by the FDA. So here, maybe to just stimulate our discussion with both of you, Dan and Hildegard, I'm going to share a case of a patient, and I think this is Mr. Everybody patient, and um, I'm sure everybody uh, has a similar case. A 60-year-old lady with no prior medical history, no comorbidities, high-risk AML, recent story, March 2019. First CR after three plus seven consolidation. So really nothing special. It's a complex karyotype. So she's 60. So we thought to go to uh, reduce toxicity regimen. And at this time, that was the protocol being used for Darabin, IV busulfan, uh, ATG. And because it's a family donor, fully matched and because we use ATG, five milligram per kilo total dose, thermoglobulin, uh, she got cyclosporin alone, really standard of care and this is already published. And these were PBSCs, so everything went well. Uh, she recovered by day 18 and by day 24, skin rush, erythema, 70% of the body surface area, but there were no GI or liver manifestation. 
And here, uh, before uh, getting your opinion, Dan and Hildegard, I'd like to ask our audience, uh, what would be your treatment approach in uh, this uh, uh, situation? Is it a wait and watch, actually, because after all, it's only the skin? Would you use local dermocorticosteroids alone? Is it, would you start systemic steroids, one milligram per kilo per day? Would you use ECP alone? Or maybe you have another option. And assuming there is no clinical trial, because I don't want to uh, get into the option of a clinical trial. So please respond to this. And then uh, I'll ask uh, our uh, experts about their opinion, uh, how to manage uh, uh, this case. So let me check if everybody's responding. Uh, it looks like it is working. So this is uh, good news. Okay. So, uh, Hildegard. What is your approach for this patient today in your center? Um, well, I guess you have uh, explained very well that everyone, of course, is worried about relapse, complex carrier type, uh, all of that. But uh, the patient has more than 70% body surface area involved. So we definitely would use uh, not only topical treatment, but also systemic. Uh, but uh, since this only affects the skin and would be overall grade two, we would go by the Milcherek paper and use the one milligram per kilogram. Okay, so you would rather go to a sort of a systemic treatment, but half dose. Right, and if possible, taper steroids then um, fast um, once the patient is responding. Okay. Dan, do you have the same approach? Yes, but I would add, so we would go for not more than one milligram per kilogram per day, um, prednisone, uh, and, a, and would, in such a situation, always add the topical treatment with calcium, uh, topical calcineurine inhibitor and topical corticosteroids. We use the topical calcineurine inhibitor twice daily and the topical steroid once. Um, and if the patient is responding rapidly, we would probably just go for that. And the question would be what to do if the patient turns to be steroid refractory or steroid dependent. That would, that's not the question, that, but then ECP would be an, 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 a clearly an option in such a situation to get as fast as possible rid of the steroids, not only because of the relapse risk, but usually elderly patients do... Uh, do not tolerate steroids for a long time um, uh, um, and tend to get a rapid muscle loss. And that, that would be something which I would fear beside relapse. Interesting, interesting. Uh, I like your answers. And this is why I thought uh, to share with both of you our experience, actually. And I agree with you that uh, this patient, anyway, uh, would fit clearly in the criteria of the one milligram per kilo of steroids. Uh, but we thought in, our, in my center to say, well, if we want really to decrease uh, steroids and avoid their side effects, but also really uh, go away from immunosuppression to combine it with uh, ECP. And this is uh, what we published uh, a couple of years ago, a retrospective study because ECP is for us standard of care. Uh, and just to show you the, uh, and this is first line treatment, similar, you know, exactly what we have seen in uh, this patient, where obviously you can see the majority of the guys we considered for this study had mainly skin stage uh, two. Uh, only a couple of patients uh, went beyond uh, stage uh, two. And we managed to give a median number of ECP uh, sessions 13 from three to 36. And 
actually ECP was discontinued because mainly of complete resolution. That's the most frequent scenario. So that's uh, good news. It's not controlled. You may tell me, well, uh, you could have achieved the same result without ECP, but there were no serious adverse events. And we had the usual, uh, actually, uh, bacterial, fungal, viral infections in this population. And we had, unfortunately, one fatal case, which obviously wasn't related to ECP. And what's really interesting is that you can achieve up to 60% CR and an 81% uh, overall response rate by day uh, 28. Uh, and this is uh, actually, uh, I thought, uh, uh, quite uh, uh, attractive. You can see here the kinetics of response. And obviously, although you may question the concept of comparing responders versus non-responders, but nevertheless, if you respond well, you do rather well. And actually, uh, there was also a small experience of using ECP for first-line treatment after haploid post -Sci because everybody claims that post -Sci would eradicate uh, uh, GVHD. That's not always the case, and I'm sure you have the same experience. And again, it is definitely uh, feasible and uh, uh, well uh, tolerated with promising uh, results. And again, I do acknowledge the single center nature, uh, the non-randomized nature, etc. So any comments, uh, Hildegard, uh, Dan, on, on this? And would you change your approach today? Or how, how, are there patients where you would like to see this kind of combinations of ECP and steroids? Well, thank you for sharing this um, really beautiful data set. Even by the time when I read your publication, um, I thought about that. What I was, and, and it's really very nice response rates that you do have. Um, what I was wondering by looking back, of course, um, one has to keep in mind that the time you treated these patients, we were all very careful with the steroid taper. So you could also show even for stage one, two patients, uh, they were kept on steroids quite some time. Would you these days see it as an advantage to taper then steroids more rapidly once they are started under ECP. And that's what we also saw in our patients who were steroid refractory. When they do respond, it's not a problem to taper more rapidly. And they have, in addition, besides the response, the huge advantage that they are off steroids and don't have the side effects. So I think that is something, although it's speculative and we don't have so much data, I also showed the data set from the Hamburg group where they were also able to taper steroids rapidly in refractory patients even, that to me this would also be an interesting concept, not only use ECP so early to have high response rates, but also to spare patients of steroids and maybe do an even more rapid taper. Excellent, looks fantastic. Uh, Dan, any thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, actually, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, um, and, and you know, you probably already know my, my, my thoughts in advance, uh, kind of being part of the magic team. Uh, I, I really uh, regard, or not, that, that's not my personal opinion, it's just the experience of the biomarker analysis that acute chivacious is quite heterogeneous. Mm -hmm. We do have patients who respond always to steroids, and we may discuss using a steroid-free approach. And actually, there's an already a two publication out uh, for the low-risk patient that it's either equal or even better. But itacitinib is not um, uh, approved yet for that purpose, and it depends on low-risk biomarks. Um, uh, and I could imagine that ECP, as you already mentioned, may play a role as well. And I would like to see such an approach as Hildek just alluded to, 
uh, to have maybe uh, just a very brief course, or if at all, uh, in, in the low risk patients to, to 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 spare steroids. And then the high risk patients, actually, Francis Ayuk is just performing such a trial to identify the patients by biomarker who would do on the, the uh, badly with their GVH disease upfront and to use an intensified schedule of ECP just to prevent that happen. So, and, and the beauty of ECP is uh, you clearly do not over immunosuppress those patients and those, and one of the challenges is, doesn't matter anyway, uh, and the, one of the challenges is to, to perform that outpatient and long distance travel, but acute GVH disease patients with high risk are inpatient anyway. So that, uh, and 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 we just w eagerly wait for the data and we, we do have the controls. And I, I think once we have shown that it it makes a difference, I would regard that as some, some, something like a standard upfront. But so overall, I would uh, um, uh, um, vote for a uh, risk adapted approach and ECP could play a, a major role. Excellent. That makes sense. So when, when you use ECP, Hildegard, what would be the schedule? Is it a weekly? Is it a twice weekly? Is there any role of uh, uh, sort of like dose intensity? Although I know it's not about dosing uh, ECP. Uh, and for how long, actually? When would we decide to stop it? Or when do we decide to give maintenance? I mean, for acute GVHD, um, I think it's important to have this <clears throat> intensified schedule. That means that you'll treat patients on a weekly basis, uh, two to three times a week. Um, we usually started for the first two weeks with uh, three times a week and then go to two times a week. Um, uh, from our data set, it doesn't make a difference whether it's two consecutive days or just two days a week. Uh, the Houston group um, published um, an acute GVHD study, and they also claim that they uh, administer five treatments a week in acute GVHD patients early after transplant. We were not, we would not be able to do so, because um, especially in the early phase, like what you showed here, day 24, um, patients uh, don't have so high counts early after engraftment. Uh, even if you do treat them two to three times a week, um, it can be that they, uh, in the first weeks, uh, need GCSF uh, or platelets uh, for support uh, until uh, the engraftment is more stable. Uh, so, but definitely our recommendation based on our data and also what other centers have um, uh, reported is uh, treat them for acute GVHD weekly. Uh, two to three times a week. Um, uh, we then start the, the tape of the steroids once they respond. They needn't have a partial or complete response. And once they are off steroids or are below 10 milligram per day and have responded completely, uh, we stop ECP in the pilot study. We did maintenance treatment for up to nine months, but we didn't see any flare ups. So uh, there is no necessity in acute GVHD to do maintenance ECP. Excellent. Thank you very much. Let me share with you another case, guys, because this discussion is really exciting. And this is a case uh, where, uh, well, let me, I'm going very quickly, probably. Yes, here it is. So it's a five-year-old uh, black gentleman. And we know that evaluating skin GVHD in a black patient can be slightly different from a Caucasian patient. So this is, uh, okay, someone is playing with my slides. Uh, okay, so while waiting for the slide, I remember very well my case. So this is a black male with MDS who received actually a nine out of 10 uh, mismatched uh, unrelated uh, peripheral blood stem cells. And we have used cyclosporin, MMF, and uh, ATG for GVHD prophylaxis. 
this patient did not experience acute GVC. Thank you. Here I can see the technical platform managed to get uh, my slides back, but I was on the right track. That's fine. So this patient didn't get acute GVHD, but he developed at some point scleroderma, but also had eye and oral involvement by the third and fourth months after transplant. So he was started on prednisone, one milligram per kilo, and continued to receive cyclosporin because it wasn't stopped yet. But you could see this is a mismatch unrelated donor. So he's our high risk uh, patient. And actually after eight weeks, he nearly achieved a partial response, but was definitely impacted by chronic GVHD. So before going into the discussion, as we, has just, we have just done, I think we have a polling uh, question here. So if we can, yes. So what would be the treatment approach for such a patient? Uh, well, we want you to use only one option. So it's wait and watch. I don't know if you're happy with this. You would introduce ruxolitinib. You would introduce a brutinib. You would introduce ECP, or you will use something else outside clinical trial again because obviously clinical trial is more difficult so please vote and then we'll start the discussion with the team okay while well, waiting for your responses i would like simply to remind all of us the indications for a second line uh, treatment uh, in chronic GVHD, and we owe this to Dan, who is here with us. This is your publication. Uh, it's about progression. Uh, if minimum of one milligram per kilo per day of prednisone for two weeks, it's about stable disease between four and eight weeks when you are above 0.5 milligram per kilo per day prednisone. It's the inability to taper uh, below 0.5, or it's the intolerance of the first line. And here I kindly remind you that uh, this patient actually uh, was treated for eight weeks uh, and was already receiving cyclosporin. And uh, we got the, the answers there and actually uh, people uh, are definitely uh, hesitating. I mean, majority are in favor of getting ECP, but some people introduce ruxolitinib. So uh, actually before the era of ruxolitinib, uh, Dan and uh, Hildegard, uh, you may remember uh, this work from more than 10 years ago. I think we had a lot of fun. And you have kindly invited me to be part of it, although that was the German speaking consensus and my German was very, very poor, uh, still very poor, by the way. Uh, and actually we uh, graded photophoresis as being one of the excellent uh, uh, options. Maybe the story today with the approvals of the drugs I mentioned, uh, Ibrutinib, uh, Belumozidib, Ruxolitinib, maybe the story is different from 2011 or 2010. So I wonder what are your thoughts at this stage? Uh, let's start uh, with you, Dan. Yeah, I think that's a challenging case. And and my personal experience and probably also the, the not, not, not probably, the, the publications show that mismatched transplants um, uh, using peripheral stem cells uh, are, are usually associated with a high frequency of chronic GVH disease and high frequency of steroid refractory chronic GVH disease and more treatment lines than, for instance, in a BMT uh, match setting. Um, and so the, the question what to start is not an easy one, to be honest. Um, uh, not an easy one because of approval status. Um, 
I, I, I would regard in this situation, ruxolitinib and ECP as equal. If there's any history of infectious complications, I would rather go for, uh, for ECP. If there's no history of, uh, of for infectious complication, uh, and, and, and maybe no peripheral venous access. That's something which is also one of the challenges applying ECP. I would probably start with Ruxo, and if this fails, uh, additional ECP would be an option. So, so that those are the thoughts. Uh, but I expect that patient to be on, on a very long run on immunosuppression. So having a low tox efficient treatment early on which could be tolerated for a long time would be crucial. Thank you very much. Uh, but obviously, if the case was easy, I wouldn't have chosen it for the discussion. <laughs> Hild Hildegard, yeah. what, what do you think? Um, I mean, um, I think what, what we also would look at is whether this patient has um, high-risk chronic GVHD with regard to progressive onset, what is not the case because he didn't have acute GVHD, but whether platelets at onset were below 100,000. Because we have, from our perspective study, still uh, for the ones who have uh, platelets below 100,000, only about a third alive after three years, what is a very poor prognosis. So we currently are running a study where we use ECP first line in these uh, high-risk patients already. Uh, the other thing is, uh, since you here mentioned sclerotic features, we know that ECP works very well um, in a sclerosis, skin sclerosis, uh, and even with low steroid doses, uh, there's also high response rates for oral involvement. So we would probably um, uh, recommend ECP early in this patient due to the sclerotic features. Of course, like uh, what Daniel has said, if a patient lives far away, has um, problems with venous access, we probably would use ruxolitinib first. But otherwise, we still use ECP second line a lot in sclerodermatous patients and have um, quite nice response rates. One also shouldn't forget that uh, ruxo um, has only around between 40 and 50 percent responses in skin involvement. Uh, so um, there is still room here, or you could consider a combination treatment, of course, of Brooks and ECP. Okay, so now I think uh, these are uh, great words of uh, wisdom and what you were alluding to actually, and I took this from uh, some of the uh, Mary Flowers paper in 2008, uh, where indeed uh, uh, ECP is uh, quite effective in steroid refractory dependent or even intolerant uh, chronic uh, GBHD. But again, uh, as Dan nicely mentioned, that was before the era of ruxolitinib and definitely uh, one may consider also ruxolitinib with uh, all the uh, side effects that can be associated and uh, that we may not be able to apply to this uh, patient. Let's me let me move now to a third part in this discussion because actually we had a lot of questions and we know it's very important because we've been talking about the treatment, how to treat acute and chronic GVHD, uh, but especially in chronic GVHD, because we're talking about months and years, supportive care is important. So I would like each of you, please, to comment on your uh, practice, your real life practice in your center when you have Let's go back to my patient, you know, this uh, uh, black gentleman who's receiving, as you nicely said, uh, immunosuppression probably over the long term, whether ECP or something else. Actually, we gave ECP and uh, he's doing rather well. Uh, what kind of uh, supportive care you would provide to these patients? I have put here the infections, the vaccinations, but I guess 
there are many other issues to consider like psychological support, nutrition, uh, rehabilitation. W what are your programs in your respective centers? Should I, yeah, Hilde. Uh, uh, well, I mean, what we for sure do, and that would also fit to the patient that you uh, presented, uh, is um, be very strict about pneumococci, pneumocystis, and zoster prophylaxis. It can even be that patients who don't have active chronic GVHD any longer have um, basically um, functional asplenia, for example, how are jolly bodies? And that would mean they are lifelong at risk for encapsulated bacteria. So we um, recommend then uh, pneumococci uh, vaccinations on a regular basis, uh, check the titers. Um, and um, we don't have all under antifungal prophylaxis only if they are on steroids. Um, and uh, with regard to like CMV reactivation, um, as, as long as they are severely immunocompromised, we also check for that uh, for prolonged periods of time. Of course, as we all know, during the COVID pandemic, um, it's quite a challenge. So uh, our patients receive the information to, in case uh, they or their relatives at home have any clinical symptoms, that they should um, do a SARS-CoV-2 test uh, uh, quite early. Uh, and uh, call us uh, because we have now medications available to avoid uh, severe courses of COVID-19. Uh, we also strongly recommend that their relatives and surroundings uh, receive vaccinations on a regular basis. Um, and um, if possible, uh, we send them uh, to rehabilitation to, to specialized centers. Uh, where they have a more um, combined um, um, uh, treatment program that includes physiotherapy, uh, nutritional support, um, a lot of counseling, also psychosocial. Um, of course, osteoporosis, uh, prophylaxis and treatment is important. Uh, and um, so there, uh, there is a lot of, of additional um, counseling uh, that takes place. Um, and uh, this is, I guess, also one of the benefits of patients. For example, if they are in the ECP program, they come in quite frequently. They stay here for a couple of hours. They have the team uh, they can talk to. And uh, for that reason, they receive a lot of uh, uh, recommendations, support, and counseling. And if you talk to patients, they are really unhappy if they have to uh, leave the ECP program, for example, because they have responded so well, because they miss all these contacts. Well, interesting and very important, I think. And But you are a reference center, so uh, I hope that all of this is being applied in all centers. Any anything different uh, are you doing uh, than in Regensburg? No, no, actually not. Uh, just to stress that every every patient uh, uh, gets vitamin D prophylaxis and we check level, which can be very different uh, across uh, individuals and across the time. Um, uh, uh, we all usually um, 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 uh, provide a standby antibiosis for pneumococcal infections. We, we only go for prophylaxis, meaning uh, taking penicillin um, if a patient is unreliable and, 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 and at risk. And, uh, I, that, and that's really an issue which even Hildegard already stressed that can last after stop of immunosuppression. That, that's, that's an important issue. Um, otherwise, um, I it just would advocate for vaccination. Uh, there's um, a, a lot of conditions where you could vaccinate on immunosuppression, uh, and you shouldn't miss that. There's only a few situations where you should, can't do that, or where it's a high risk of failure. So for instance, if the patient doesn't produce any immunoglobulins, it may still make sense to vaccinate against SARS-CoV-2, but, but um, uh, for other vaccination, that may be not an ideal situation. And for instance, ibrutinib 
may or or rituximab, which depletes the B cells, uh, would lead to a vaccination failure. But we uh, calcineurin inhibitors, mTOR inhibitors, ruxolitinib, ECP for sure are not a reason to not to vaccinate uh, uh, for influenza, uh, SARS-CoV-2, but also the other vaccination, as long as you do not apply live vaccine, which we all know is, is not a good idea in this population. So, and I think 50 to 70% of success in chronic GVH disease is supportive care. The patients rarely die of GVH disease itself. It's infections, it, those are complications. Iron overload is for sure and frequent cofactor, which should be also taken into account. And actually, ECP is a good treatment for iron overload <laughs> um, because you just remove iron accidentally, but that helps in that situation. Uh, yeah, uh, so, and, and, and having a team of dedicated physicians um, helps a lot. That's, I think that's one of the hallmarks of a, a, a transplant center, which cares for GVH disease patients, having a multidisciplinary team which know what the trouble is in, in those patients. No, thank you very much, Dan. And I'm glad you brought clearly and strongly uh, the issue of vaccination because obviously there is a lot of misinformation now uh, since COVID about this issue. And the general recommendation except in a few exceptional cases, I think we all agree that patients should get their uh, vaccination for COVID, uh, for flu, because it would be really a pity to struggle or to suffer or to go to ICU because of a simply silly flu. And uh, I think that's really an important uh, uh, message that we would like really to emphasize because these vaccines are safe they have been given to millions of people and we physicians are also taking them. So I don't believe we're taking too much risk with our own lives and then recommending them to patients. So I would like simply to close this discussion before moving uh, to these uh, uh, new perspectives that uh, you then are gonna summarize, I'm going to summarize is that also, we are very excited about uh, the advances we've seen in both acute and chronic GHD over the last, let's say, five to 10 years. We know a little bit better about the pathophysiology. I'm not convinced we can separate GHD and GVL, but that can bring us to another debate of, uh, I think, uh, three weeks or even more. Uh, there is clearly uh, advances, but we still need to make progress. We need to improve uh, the first line treatment because in acute GVHD, we're still struggling with steroids. With chronic GVHD, it's still also steroids. Biomarkers, we've been talking about them since many years. Hopefully uh, they uh, will make uh, their way uh, into guiding uh, the treatment, but also uh, allowing to prognosticate, because obviously if you can uh, tailor uh, the treatment and identify the risk of the patient, you probably would behave uh, uh, in the treatment in a better way. 